Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for OWA Week 2023. My name is Dr. Shaimel Gamal and I am an OWA Week coordinator. Please note that this session is being recorded. OWA Week is presented by four sponsoring organizations. First, GOA on the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. Second, NOAA, the United States National Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Third, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. And last but not least, the IOC UNESCO, the Intergovernmental Oceanic Commission for the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Goa On was established in, in, 12, in 2012 with just a handful of members. Since then, Goa On has grown immensely. It now has over 1,000 members from 114 countries. Goa On also consists of nine regional hubs, which span across continent and, ocean, and uh, oceanographic regions. We will be hearing from most of them throughout our week. If you are not a member yet, you can join Goa On today by visiting goaon.org. Our week debuted in 2020 and returned in 2021 when, even, when events and conferences were postponed due to COVID-19. Following the successful in-person symposium on the ocean in a high carbon dioxide world in 2022, Goa On is bringing back our week 2023 to maintain momentum around our research and provide a virtual platform for the ocean acidification community to exchange their latest findings. We are thrilled to present a wide range of ocean acidification topics and the speakers from around the world. During the presentation, all participants are in lesson on the moon. You are welcome to type any questions into the question box which can be found at the bottom of the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. You will be monitoring incoming questions and will pose them to our speakers during the question and answer section, which will, be, which will begin immediately after the final presentation. For discussion, you can also use the raise hand function in the toolbox at the bottom of your screen, and you will, be, and you will call on uh, to ask your question directly. And with this, I'd like to introduce you to moderator for this session, Dr. Lise Wright Fairbanks from NOAA Ocean Acidification Program, USA. Dr. Lise is, uh, is the field research program specialist for NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. She coordinates activities for the NOAA Ocean Acidification Observing Network, NOAA ON including uh, OWAPs for regional coastal OWA cruises campaign and the networking of 15 plus coastal OWA modding. She earned a PhD oceanography from Rogers University, where she used the novel autonomous technology to study seasonal acidification in the US Middle Atlantic region. Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Shaima, and to our audience for tuning in around the globe. We really appreciate you being here for the session today. This session is the chemical monitoring session. Um, ocean acidification monitoring programs provide a window into the current status of ocean health worldwide. This session will explore ocean acidification monitoring techniques and survey results across a global perspective. We've got an exciting group of four speakers today who will discuss ship-based ocean acidification surveys, ocean acidification as a planetary boundary, autonomous monitoring platforms and subsurface ocean acidification signals, and polar ocean acidification process studies. Each speaker will provide a 12 to 15 minute presentation and will hold all questions until the end for a 30 minute discussion as a group. And as Shaima said, you can put any questions that come up into the Q&A box and we'll get to them during that discussion period. So with that brief introduction, I think we can begin with our first speaker um, who I'll introduce. First speaker is Dr. Weijun Tsai. 
Dr. Tsai obtained his BS in oceanography in 1982 from Jaimen University, his master's in marine chemistry in 1985 from the Shandong College of Oceanography, and his PhD in oceanography in 1992 from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He was a professor in the Department of Marine Sciences, University of Georgia from 1994 to, to 2012, and he is currently the Mary A. S. Lightthype Chair Professor of Earth, Ocean, and Environment at the University of Delaware. He is an expert in ocean and estuarine car carbon dioxide chemistry and biogeochemistry, and he is an author of over 250 peer-reviewed publications. Um, so, Ajun, you can share your screen and take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you for, for the... Okay, okay, let me present and uh, uh, this is the right, right? A presentation. Uh, yes, cool. that looks okay. good. Uh, well, thank you for, for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me to give this uh, talk. Uh, I really want just, you know, report the most recent work uh, uh, during the coastal, the uh, East Coast Ocean Acidification Research uh, by measuring carb uh, carbon 13, the stable ice pop of DIC. And this is uh, new, so I'm kind of excited and uh, still a uh, learning process. So I want to share with you. And uh, so uh, I'll give a brief introduction, talk about why we measuring uh, carbon 13. Uh, this basically for two reasons. One is you use so-called SUSE effect that is C13 uh, uh, change in the ocean as a measure of anthropogenic carbon. Let me try to use a, uh, wait a minute, a laser point. Yeah, so to as a measure of anthropogenic carbon, and secondly is, you know, uh, carbon 13 as an indicator for terrestrial and coastal zone export to global ocean. And so after the introduction, I'll talk about the analytical method, data quality assessment we did during this cruise, this 41 day cruise. And I'll present uh, the result and uh, present uh, a preliminary discussion. Uh, so uh, as we all know that anthropogenic CO2 has increased, uh, and atmospheric CO2, sorry, has increased from 280 ppm before industrial revolution to uh, almost uh, 420 uh, uh, this year. And uh, as a anthropogenic uh, for burning of fossil fuel land use, so, Accompany that the carbon 13 signal actually decreases, uh, become more negative in the atmosphere. That is because we are burning fossil fuel that is ancient biomass, which is depleted in carbon 13. So the signal not only changes with the CO2 increase, but also the ratio of C12, C13 to C12 changes greater than just uh, the C13. 12 signal. So for example, from 1970 to 1990, uh, atmospheric CO2, uh, carbon-13 signal decreased by 0.65 per mil. This is in a uh, uh, isotope uh, unit, just to show that uh, more clearly. And if you would look, uh, and, and then there's additional 0.8 per mil decrease uh, since then to the current. If you look at the absolute ratio carbon 13 to 12, which was about uh, 0.15 per mil, uh, percent in pre-industrial time and now decreased to about 0.1%. Uh, uh, so it, uh, I mean, actually 0.01%. So it's like a 10 times change. So it's a very large signal. Now, the, uh, this is called a Suze effect in the atmosphere. But in the change exchange with ocean, there is a delay there. And then we're expecting a catch up. So we are still learning about this. And uh, uh, so uh, I, according to 
you know, uh, uh, Paul Queer of the uh, from uh, University of Washington, who's been studying this for forty years, use the uh, most advanced technology. He advocated this technology for for the last forty years, as this is an independent uh, tracer for anthropogenic CO two, and he also uh, argue forcefully that is this is a more sensitive tracer than DIC itself. Now I would uh, definitely say this is independent, whether it's more sensitive. Uh, this is uh, you know partly depend on your technology. He used this very precise method of isotope ratio mass spec analysis. However, that analysis you know takes a lot of effort, and uh, so usually people take water sample back, bring it home rather than measure in the global ocean transect. So. It's a limited, uh, you know, resolution. So you only do like ten percent, uh, fifteen percent of sample compared with the DIC and alkalinity. So it's limited by the spatial and temporal resolution. And many other lab also has a precision issue. So uh, that's one uh, thing. You uh, purpose of doing carbon sorting is use it as a measure of the Suse effect of anthropogenic CO two. And the second uh, reason to do carbon 13 is it actually provides some interesting tracer for terrestrial carbon export. Uh, uh, in the past, when you model global carbon cycling, there is this term of about 0.9-ish uh, petrogram carbon come in from the 0.7 from the river, and then there is some from uh, submarine groundwater or coastal uh, ocean. And then this is balanced by a sediment, some uh, barrier in the sediment, and a degassing of the rest uh, to the atmosphere. So this is balanced that way. However, uh, Huang et al. Uh, published this paper just a, a couple of years ago to show if this is a case, then at ocean basin carbon sorting signal would it be 0.2 to 0.3 per mil too high without an additional carbon sorting depleted carbon source. So she, she and uh, her co-authors uh, increased this almost doubled to 1.4 uh, petagram carbon. Now, if that is the case, your ocean DIC uh, will be too high, right? So the, the idea they come up with is most of this increased CO2 is lost to atmosphere in coastal ocean because of short residence time of CO2. But carbon-13 has a residence time almost 10 times longer than CO2, uh, five to 10 years, a decade. So that signal can be carried to, the, uh, to balance the ocean uh, signal. However, the way they did this was based on, you know, this numeric global uh, physical biological modeling and use data. And as you can see, in outside of the coast, you know, in the Atlantic, Western Atlantic Ocean, there is almost no data, uh, and and uh, so the carbon sorting data is very limited. What I'm proposing is to measure, you know, carbon sorting in coastal zone and to see during to see during this export how the CO2 lost versus carbon sorting signal to quantify how much of this carbon export to the open ocean. And uh, of course, I have not achieved that yet. So what we made a bit major progress in the last five years is analytical method and uh, data quality. Now, in the past, as I mentioned, uh, people use this isotope ratio mass spec. It's expensive and time consuming. So you have to, you can't really bring that instrument to the shipboard. So you take a water sample back a few hundred samples rather than 3,000 uh, during a, you know, a go ship cruise, for example. So you bring that back. And, and so in most coast ocean uh, cruise, there's no carbon sorting measured. Another problem with the uh, ice operation mass spec, you don't really simultaneously measure DIC precisely. So DIC has to be measured separately. And so my goal is to develop an accurate uh, uh, to develop a portable and easily deployable system for field measurement at the sea or on the land. 
and with a precision of BIC better than plus minus uh, two mic uh, micromole per kilogram or 0.1% in seawater and a carbon 13 better than 0.05 per mil. Now, Paul Queer could do a point even better, 0.03. Uh, currently, I can achieve, we can achieve about 0.05 or better. I haven't really get to 0.02 or 03 yet. And uh, my current focus is to develop an accurate and easy to apply ca calibration method. Uh, so this is uh, the instrument that we have and uh, actually doing the, the ECOA cruise with a Piccolo and uh, 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 you know, DIC uh, analytical system too. So basically here we draw acid uh, into the, the pump, uh, syringe and then draw sample, either standard or the sample uh, on top of that. And then we just add that hosing into the reactor and then uh, bubble that and send the dry gas to the Piccolo for analysis. And you can see we use this blue color that is the area under the curve, CO2 concentration as a measure of DIC concentration. And then we average this red color is carbon 13, uh, average that with the weight uh, of the area of the CO2 and come up with a, a mean uh, carbon 13 value. Okay, so let me move on. So let's look at the data quality during this uh, analysis. We have, as I mentioned, we have 41 days and uh, lots of sample measured and uh, we were able to measure uh, most of the sample at sea and bring a, a, a quarter back home. So one important is, you know, the uh, in-house standard of stability because we are measuring uh, seawater uh, directly, not uh, use a traditional method. So we actually prepare sodium bicarbonate solution and look at, you know, as a standard and the standard was very stable, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.02 per mil. So we are very conf confident uh, and comfortable with, with this method. And we still, of course, need to uh, calibrate this, uh, our in-house standard. And we did a duplicate from a single Niskin bottle. We come up with 0 0.03 per mil, precision on the carbon 13 and uh, 0.5 micromole per kilogram with DIC. And we also did a depth profile with 11 duplication at each depth and come up with similar standard deviation and for both DIC and carbon 13. So uh, we we'll come to better than 0.05. So I'm going to, we also did a lot of CIM analysis and got a very good result to compare uh, PM, uh, AOML's uh, carbon 13 and the certified value. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to move uh, forward. And first thing I want to show you is uh, uh, we have compared with the A22, the Ghost Ship Cruise, uh, uh, NOAA did at uh, this two, uh, three station that we actually have crossover station. At a deep depths, we compare very well with uh, past data like 2021, the uh, A22 cruise, and where uh, carbon sorting is uh, lower and you know, compare with the historical data like between 200, 100 uh, meter to 1,500 meter. Carbon sorting, you see a clear decrease. This is a blue color, uh, you know, decrease our 2022 data compared with uh, 1997 or 2012. So there is a clear decrease and that decrease is more clear, is clear than the DIC increase. So that actually support Paul Queer's argument that carbon 13 is a more sensitive um, uh, uh, measure of anthropogenic CO2 uh, accumulation. But so, at deep depths, the great agree with the historical data, like our measurement uh, to 2022, 20, the circle and the square is uh, a 822 data very close. And then there's early data, yeah. 
So, and yeah. And sea surface has a strong seasonality. That is one issue we see, you know, there actually some of our data because we did a summertime and uh, the A22 was a uh, spring and, and then, yeah, so that there is a seasonality difference. So here's a lot of my, yeah, last slides of data to show the DIC distribution during the uh, cruise. This is just show the surface Okay, and the South Atlantic Bight, Mid Atlantic Bight, Gulf of May, and uh, Nova Scotia, Scotian Shore. And this is a carbon 13. And you can see there are uh, uh, enrichment, uh, in a, uh, there are actually depletion of DIC in the Gulf of May to, at the bi uh, biological production hotspots. And at these sites, you see very high. Carbon 13, that is because biological process preferentially takes C12. And we calculated what should be equilibrated the value with the atmosphere for DIC and carbon 13. And then we take the difference, we call that disequilibrated. And overall, the DIC issues you know, in the South Atlantic body, you have net heterotrophic, uh, and there is a land export with higher DIC. And in this case, Long Island, the Sun, the, the Delaware Bay, Chesapeake Bay, they all come up with uh, more negative carbon 13. And uh, now this, this equipment values turn out to be a lot higher than what the Paul Queer reported for the Atlantic, the open ocean at the same uh, latitude. So we're still learning what does that really tell us. So let me move to uh, this once, oh sorry, there's one more slide. So you can see clearly biological uh, production versus respiration influence at a, as a delta, the disequilibrium of carbon sorting signal and disequilibrium of DIC following, you know, this is an island the sun, this is Atlant yeah, South Atlantic bite. But then there are other process uh, influencing this uh, if it's all biological and respiration and production and respiration, it will follow that straight yeah, that line. So in summary, uh, or concluding remark, we have achieved this analytical goal of measuring simultaneously and precisely of carbon 13 and the isotope to the precision we proposed, 0.1% better than point, for DIC and 0.05 per mil for carbon 13. However, developing an accurate and easy to apply calibration method is still on the way. We just uh, we send a lot of you know, solid uh, sample to Europe and to uh, 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 Dalhousie University, to Dr. Uh, uh, Wallace Lab uh, and to UC Davis to other places to compare the calibration. And then using common sorting, data to quantify ocean energy source effect makes progress. You can see clear carbon-13 uh, decrease, uh, but the lack of historical data is still a problem. And uh, using carbon-13 data uh, to quantify the terrestrial and coastal carbon export is still a major challenge, and we're still learning that. Thank you. Um, should I? I'm Thanks, sure. Virginia. You can stop sharing now. Um, thank you for your talk. That was great. Um, as a reminder, we're going to hold questions until after all of our presentations. Um, so if you anyone in the audience has questions, please put them in the, the Q&A box and we'll get to them then. Um, next, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Helen Findlay from Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK. Helen is a biological oceanographer at Plymouth Marine Laboratory, interested in understanding the effects of climate change and ocean acidification on marine ecosystems and the application of this knowledge to maintain a healthy, sustainable ocean with a particular focus on the Arctic and Northeast Atlantic. She is a member of the Executive Council for the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, Go On, and lead coordinator for the Northeast Atlantic Ocean acidification regional hub of Go On, which aim to establish accurate global monitoring of acidification, shared knowledge and capacity building to underpin solutions. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Helen to start your presentation. Thanks. 
Thank you very much. I'll just uh, find that now. So hopefully that's sharing okay for you. Yes, it looks good, Helen. Great. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this session. Um, a little bit of a imposter syndrome here as a biological oceanographer speaking in the chemistry session, um, but I have an interest very much in in linking up the chemistry and the biology, um, and really understanding kind of slightly bigger picture impacts um, on how the biology and chemistry interact. And that's um, one of the reasons that I've um, work to put this presentation together with Richard Feely, uh, Lighting Jiang and Nina Bednasek have helped produce some of the slides for this. Um, so I'm going to be talking about oceanification as a planetary boundary. Um, so what do we mean by that? Well, I'm not <laughs> going to dwell on this slide uh, as an oceanification week. Hopefully everyone's familiar with this. What we're really interested here in is the fact that we have oceanification causing a decrease in ocean pH, and that's leading to less available carbonate ions, decreasing aragonite and calcite saturation states. And um, just to have some biology in a chemistry session, uh, we need to remember that organisms actually can respond to any of those uh, um, and a lot of the chemists and the chemistry is really based around the understanding that organisms utilize calcium carbonate to build their shells and skeletons and that's why aragonite and calcite saturation states have been quite fundamental important um, indicators for oceanification and will feature a lot in this talk Many of you will have come across these, hopefully. The most recent boundary um, paper came out um, just in September, uh, which was released by Richardson et al, um, 2023. Um, but actually the, the discussion about planetary boundaries has been going on for a number of years now with the first uh, paper coming out in 2009 uh, from Rockström et al. Um, and there was a, a midterm paper in 2015. So the planetary boundaries were set up, uh, it was an idea that Rockström and colleagues had to identify the Earth system processes and associated thresholds which, if they were crossed, could generate unacceptable environmental change. And they decided on nine such processes which they thought would be necessary to redefine planetary boundaries, uh, which included climate change, uh, rate of biodiversity loss, both in the terrestrial and marine zone, interference with nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, stratospheric ozone depletion, ocean acidification, global freshwater use, change in land use, and chemical pollution and atmospheric aerosol uh, loading. So. In 2009, they had managed to assess seven out of those nine and concluded that three of those boundaries had crossed what they called a safe operating space. So if it was in this green zone here, they considered that the, the values of these boundaries hadn't been crossed. And if it was kind of going into the orange or red, you could see the extent of how far uh, we'd gone into a, a non-safe or a high risk zone um, of these planetary boundaries. In 2015, they did a, another reanalysis and released the paper suggesting that now four of the boundaries had been crossed, um, but still they hadn't um, necessarily quantified all of them properly with novel entities and atmospheric loading still being needing to quantify. And then in 2023, they've released this uh, latest paper suggesting that we've crossed six of the nine planetary boundaries um, and they've uh, assessed all of those. So where does ocean acidification sit in all of that? Let's zoom in a little bit. Um, and they suggest here that um, globally, ocean acidification is, is just about under the boundary. So what did they put as the boundary? Let's just delve into that a little bit. So the ocean acidification process was defined by them as the carbonate ion concentration. It's defined as the average global surface ocean saturation state with respect to aragonite. And they decided uh, that they would use a value based on literature and looking at and when certain processes happened and, and certain values were crossed of an 80% or above um, aragonite saturation state of the mean pre-industrial um, levels for the surface ocean. Um, so they found in the literature the pre-industrial value they suggest is 3.44, uh, which gave 80% of that is about 2.75. And so they assessed the current value um, using actually data from 2021 paper um, that suggests that the, two, the latest um, mean saturation state for the open oceans was 2.8 global oceans. 
so we'd not actually yet hit this 2.7 um, zone, this, this boundary zone for oceanification. So what I want to discuss with you today is, is whether we feel as a ocean acidification community, whether that, that uh, firstly, if that boundary is, is a, a good one, and, and secondly, have we actually, do we, do we think there's better ways of measuring this boundary and, and have we maybe already crossed it if we look at more details of that? So um, Richard Feely and colleagues have re recently published a paper um, I think it's either out now or it's, it's about to come out very soon, um, showing the observations and models are in good agreement over the timescales of the observations. So they took data from the last uh, 40, 50 decades, so 1975 through to uh, pretty much the present day, and showed that for the carbonate parameters, uh, the observations here are in the grey bars, and the model data here in blue and red are the two emission scenarios they use. So we've got low emissions and high emission scenarios. And as you can see quite clearly from all of these graphs for the carbonate parameters, um, that the, the the model data and the the observational data fits very nicely um, to suggest that actually it's 25 onwards. Um, so we won't have seen disparity in in the um, the emission scenarios that what how the carbonate system responds in the future. So they were able to show that the rate of aragonite saturation state change is about minus 0.08 per decade, which is actually slower than the Richardson et al. 2023 planetary boundary paper suggested. And the global average aragonite saturation state for 2023 is 2.89 based on these observations. So observations of both the rate of decline and the current global average suggest that the Richardson analysis actually underestimates the current global average aragonite saturation state. So they gave it a 2.8 value. Um, these observations suggest that the value is actually around 2.89, which suggests that we're maybe not as near to the global boundary um, as, as they were putting us at. However, we know that regional variations exist and these are important. And I think uh, what's important to remember is the, the go back to the rationale that Richardson and the, the prior papers that set up this planetary boundary actually created that 80% value for, against. So the rationale behind that value was actually, um, it was recognized it was quite subjective, um, but they proposed two reasons for choosing the 80% about 80% of the pre-industrial value. The first was to keep high latitude surface waters above aragonite under saturation. And the second was to ensure adequate conditions for most coral systems, uh, based on some literature that coral systems will be impacted when you get to around a saturation state of about three to 3.5 um, or above. So this is again, uh, Richard Feely's recent um, observation data from 1961 through to 2020 at the bottom here. On the left panel, we've got aragonite saturation state and on the right is calcite saturation state. And you can see that um, as you go forward in time, uh, all of these maps show that you're having a decrease in aragonite saturation and calcite saturation states. Um, but actually there's pockets in the polar regions that are already seeing um, under saturation and actually uh, the highest rates of change are actually occurring in these mid uh, low latitude areas where we expect to have tropical. So actually we have this 80 spent value maybe doesn't represent this regional variability as well as, as we would hope it would and isn't actually characterizing these um, regional variations very well. So what we can do is actually look at that uh, regional assessment. So if we take that 8% value and use regional data to actually see where uh, each region has is relative to its pre-industrial value, then we can actually show that four out of seven of the ocean basins have crossed that, that um, theoretical boundary. Um, so this is the this global value here is the same as the Richardson one, and then these are regional um, values taken from uh, Jagatel 2023 uh, model data, and so actually having 
regionally, despite the fastest rates of aragonite change occurring in the mid latitudes, it's these higher latitude regions that are already crossing or have already crossed the boundaries relative to their regional pre-industrial states. And I think that's quite concerning that um, on a on a global scale, we're suggesting that these planetary boundaries have not yet been cro crossed, but actually we know that on regional levels, they're actually already reaching quite um, quite important states in terms of risk to organisms. So moving on to that, um, we can actually use work uh, from Nina Bednasek and, and colleagues and, and others that have looked at how um, organisms respond. So we've got to remember that so far we've been talking about a chemical threshold, but actually if we want to think about uh, biological responses, and, and that's arguably why we're interested in, in how these things change and why these things change. If you map the aragonite saturation state um, in the surface zero to 200 meters based on glowed up, um, then this is the kind of image you get. So you start to see these hot spots of, of low aragonite saturation state in the high latitude regions, Southern Ocean. And um, what Nina and colleagues were able to do is to show the percentage of pteropods, which are these um, org organisms, that these, these snails that float around in the, in the ocean, um, they start to dissolve at certain levels of aragonite saturation state. And the percentage with severe dissolution um, can, is, is mapped here on this bottom uh, map here. And you can see areas of red here where over sort of 50% of um, pteropods that you would expect to find with severe dis dissolution in these regions. And so arguably, again, using even using annual mean estimates, but on a regional scale and related to some organisms, these areas cannot be considered in a, as a safe operating space. So how else can we think about planetary boundaries? Well, would it be better to think about atmospheric CO2 concentrations or maybe CO2 emissions? Um, and I, I just wanted to put this these couple of slides up here to show, um, as, as many of you probably understand and realize that if we plot atmospheric um, CO2 concentration on the x-axis and then either pH on the y-axis and these top two panels or aragonite saturation state on the bottom two panels, then it, going into the future, depending on the emission scenarios, you obviously get different declines in pH and aragonite saturation state. But what's important to remember is that actually there's a longevity to acidification. And we talk about that in terms of the geological record, but actually we can show that happening moving into the future where we have these scenarios where atmospheric CO2 is actually being brought down, but actually the pH and the aragonite saturation state, depending on the buffering capacity of the ocean in the regions that we're talking about, don't actually just linearly respond to the return of the CO2 back to pre-industrial or, or present day levels. And so the carbonate system is not responding linearly to CO2, we know that. And also we know that organisms respond to different elements of the carbonate system. So it's not just a ragonite saturation state that's important. The Arctic Ocean is, is one of these low buffer areas, and we can actually see that um, even under this low emission scenario, by the end of the century, we're starting to return the CO2 back down to present day levels. But actually, we're undersaturated in these conditions, and it doesn't bounce back. Um, it will take a long time to bounce back because of that low, lower buffer ability in the Arctic Ocean. And again, if we kind of throw on top of that, the fact that we're talking about organism responses potentially being above this chemical threshold, then you can see that actually um, at all points from now onwards, um, these organisms, uh, pteropods in particular, as an example here, are already um, at severe risk in these regions. So CO2 concentration and emission pathways are going to matter moving forward and how we discuss these um, boundaries and conditions in the future. So just to kind of highlight how that's been moved forward then, um, some people have, have actually looked at different ways of taking on these planetary boundaries. So Dow et al in 2018 um, actually calculated a boundary based on the remaining cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide from human activities. Um, which would ma maintain that acceptable aragonite saturation state. And they looked globally and, and locally for Switzerland um, to see whether where we were in terms of a global limit for ocean acidification. And they calculated that actually it, they, there would be a global limit for acidification of 7.6 gigatons per year 
of cumulative CO2 emissions. And as many of you realize, we are emitting around about 13, 39 gigatons per year. So we're about five times over the limit on a global uh, scale, if we think of this boundary in that sense. Um, and Switzerland was, was way above that, 14.5 times the Swiss limit. And more recently, there was a master's project, Rocker Sattel, um, did a similar sort of calculation for Norway and also showed that for acidification, they were uh, well across the boundaries, um, suggesting that they had a Norway's limit. Norway's limit for acidification was around 685 megatons of CO2 um, for that period. So again, considering CO2 emissions, uh, we can show that the boundary has been crossed and actually Maybe arguably that boundary provides a more relevant value for policy makers and for actually doing something about these these issues, uh, both globally and nationally, because CO2 emissions is something that we, we all talk about and the policy makers are very familiar with how we can actually deal with that. Um, whereas a ragonite saturation state in many respects is a meaningless value to um, stakeholders. So I just want to end here with the conclusion saying that Oceanification is near but not crossed, these boundaries based on this global average 80% pre-industrial value. But if we do the same thing on a regional basis, we can show that the boundary has been crossed in four out of seven bay ocean basins. Some biological responses suggest we're already at or past a safe boundary. And we, um, I think it's quite clear that we maybe need to be thinking about other uh, these boundaries uh, think of other parameters instead of just aragonite saturation state. So, for example, either CO2 emissions, which show that the global footprint is five times above the limit of acidification. Hydrogen ion, for example, could be another one that we think about. It shows different regional trends and patterns. And we know that there's different evidence for biological responses to that. Coming up again, and the most recently by uh, Town 2023 shows that time of emergence shows that all oceanification in most regions, if not all regions, is now kind of coming outside of its natural variability, which suggests again that even including this variability into these assessments um, suggests that we're beyond a safe limit. So I will leave on that note. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen, for your presentation. That was really informative and I think it'll bring up a lot of good questions for our, our discussion. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Andrea Fossbender from NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory in the USA. Uh, Andrea is a physical scientist at, the, at NOAA's PMEL um, in Seattle, Washington. She is also an affiliate assistant professor in chemical oceanography at the University of Washington and an adjunct assistant professor in ocean sciences at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Andrea studies marine carbon and biogeochemical cycling as it relates to the ocean's role in global climate. She earned a master's degree and PhD in oceanography, as well as a graduate certificate in climate science from the University of Washington. And she was a postdocs applying climate expertise fellow hosted at NOAA PMEL for two years before joining the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, where she led the Marine Biogeochemistry Group for four years. In 2020, Andrea transitioned to PMEL, where she leads the lab's biogeochemical Argo effort as part of the Global Observations of Biogeochemistry and Ocean Physics Group. Um, Andrea, take it away. I can hear me. Um, I'm not used to Zoom, so I accidentally just drew a line on my presentation. So hopefully that was enjoyable for all. Um, I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity um, to talk about this work that I've done over the past year or so with um, my co-authors listed here. Um, let's see here. All right. So ocean acidification is predominantly considered a surface intensified process, and that's because anthropogenic carbon primarily enters the ocean through air-sea exchange of CO2, and thus the highest concentrations of anthropogenic carbon are at the ocean surface. And as a result, the majority of ocean acidification studies that are published to date have focused on surface impacts as opposed to the subsurface impacts, though so there are a number of papers and more coming out. Some of these studies that have focused on the subsurface impacts have identified amplified subsurface signals in ocean acidification, and I'm defining that as changes in OA metrics caused solely by the accumulation of anthropogenic carbon. 
And so, for example, this is um, one study by Carter et al. where they found patchy signals of elevated ocean acidification driven pH changes below the surface throughout the Pacific. Another study by Loveset et al. confirming that these patchy pH signals were found uh, throughout all ocean basins. Um, my co-authors and I looked in the Pacific and found exceptionally large changes in the hydrogen ion concentration at depth and also saw these patchy subsurface pH changes. And then more recently, Arroyo et al. found similar signals for pH, hydrogen ion concentration, PCO2, and the Revell sensitivity factor, which isn't shown here, for the open North Pacific and also the coastal North Pacific Ocean. So if we look at this particular figure from Arroyo et al., it shows data from the open ocean North Pacific um, as the circles. The vertical axis is the anthropogenic carbon concentration. The y-axis is the PCO2 value. And then the x-axis is the Revell factor, which is defined as the relative change in PCO2 uh, associated with the relative change in DIC, assuming all other variables are held constant. And it's essentially a metric of seawater buffering. <clears throat> so high Revell factors are low buffering. And then the colors of the circles indicate the PCO2 change induced by anthropogenic carbon addition over this period. And what you see is that the largest PCO2 changes um, due to ocean acidification are found at depths with very moderate anthropogenic carbon concentrations. So not near the surface where the highest values are. And these changes are also found at um, locations with really high Revell factor, so low buffering and also high PCO2 values. And so this finding led us to hypothesize that amplified subsurface ocean acidification was being caused by interactions between natural and anthropogenic carbon in regions of naturally low buffering capacity that are associated with extensive respired carbon concentrations. And so if we think about kind of carbon in the global ocean, anthropogenic carbon is uh, the distributions reflect uh, the uptake of a non-steady state, steady state tracer that's sourced from the atmosphere that comes into the ocean and then is passively redistributed through circulation. Whereas natural carbon distributions from the solubility pump and biological pumps exhibit a large vertical carbon gradient that's in the opposite direction of the anthropogenic carbon. Um, and the heterogeneous biological re remineralization portion of this is really what dominates uh, the vertical gradient in most regions. And so because of this, we hypothesize that regional variability in the vertical gradients of natural and anthropogenic carbon probably create regional hotspots where the gradients intersect and induce these sort of large um, carbonate system nonlinearities that we were seeing in the Arroyo study. So to test this hypothesis, we use the BLODAP uh, V2-2016B mapped product by Loveset et al. Um, that's normalized to the year 2002, as well as another data set of preformed property estimates based on GLODAP, as well as transport matrix output from an ocean inverse circulation model that's constrained with GLODAP uh, observations. And that's work done, led by Brendan Carter. And so that's preform properties that are on the same gridded fields as the GLODAP data set. And just for reference, preformed ocean properties are those that seawater had when last in the surface mixed layer. So before any water subsurface accumulates carbon from biological processes. So that means that the difference between the GLODAP data set and the preform properties reflects the biological additions from respiration of organic matter and dissolution of calcium carbonate minerals. <clears throat> um, and we'll go into too many details here, but I'll just briefly explain the method. So we use the GLODAP mapped product to calculate anthropogenic carbon-driven changes in OA metrics of interest, including pH, saturation state, PCO2, hydrogen ion concentration, and the Revell factor. Um, I don't have time to talk about the Revell factor today. Um, and to do this, we essentially, you know, the GLODAP greater product provides fields for pH, for example, it also provides a DIC field and anthropogenic carbon fields. So you can estimate what we're calling the pre-industrial DIC, but we're not accounting for anything except for anthropogenic carbon accumulation here, just to be clear. And then you can difference the pH values in the pseudo pre-industrial period and the modern period, which is year 2002 uh, for this reference, and you get an anthropogenic change. And this is just an example for pH. We can do it for all of the parameters. And we essentially do the exact same thing using the Carter preform properties um, so we can get an estimate of 
pH in the modern ocean in the absence of biogenic byproducts. And we can get an estimate of pH in the pseudo pre-industrial ocean in the absence of biogenic byproducts and look at the anthropogenic change in pH. Now, differences between these two estimates of the pH change um, would indicate that there are nonlinearities in that effect. So if, if the carbonate system were linear, we'd get the exact same number from, from the blue versus the orange calculations, but we know that that's not the case. And so this is our way of calculating this nonlinear component. So I'll come back to that in a minute, but first I'll just show the primary results which are the changes in the OA metrics from the pseudo pre-industrial period to the year 2002. This is a transect in the Pacific. And so you can see here the changes in pH, aragonate saturation state, PCO2 and the hydrogen ion concentration. And you can notice that it's a little hard to tell, but you can see that there are some subsurface large signals in PCO2 and the hydrogen ion concentration. But these are actually a lot easier to see if we simply look at the changes at depth relative to the mean change in the upper 50 meters. So if we do that, anywhere here that is red is showing places where the subsurface changes exceed the changes in the overlying, the local overlying waters. And so if we just quickly add on the Atlantic and Indian sectors, you can see that the signals are consistent. And what we find are that PCO2 and the hydrogen ion concentration exhibit highly amplified uh, subsurface ocean acidification changes. Um, and we also see that pH exhibits these kind of patchy changes that are consistent with, with what other um, people have found in the past. We don't see any amplified subsurface changes in the saturation state though. And so just for some reference, um, in the year 2002, the atmospheric PCO2 perturbation was 92 microatmospheres. So our results indicate that subsurface OA driven PCO2 changes in the year 2002 not only exceed the overlying surface, surface ocean changes by a significant amount and across really broad ocean regions, but they also exceed the atmospheric CO2 change that's driving ocean acidification itself. And in some case, the subsurface change is doubling the atmospheric forcing. So around here, when you see the North Pacific, for example, 100 microatmosphere higher changes below the surface than at the surface. So if we now look at differences um, in the OA metrics, when we calculate these changes both with and without the biogenic byproducts, we can isolate this nonlinear term. And what we find is that the carbonate chemistry nonlinearities are working to amplify changes in pH, PCO2, and the hydrogen ion concentration. And they're actually working to dampen the changes in aragonite saturation state. And this nonlinear effect is really a small portion of the overall total change um, in pH and saturation state. Um, but the nonlinear component is actually a huge fraction of the total change in the PCO2 and hydrogen ion concentration changes. So if we add on again, the Atlantic and Indian transects, you can see that the results are consistent. And the thing that's notable, I'd mentioned um, these Amplified pH, nonlinear pH um, amplification at depth is pretty large and coherent, but it's not large enough to actually show up coherently in the total pH changes that we see, which I think helps to explain why we see these patchy signals throughout the ocean. Um, and uh, just want to mention as well that these are the changes up to the year 2002. So uh, it's possible that perhaps the signal is um, more visible. Uh, now with modern information. Um, okay, so just to summarize this section, the largest changes in multiple metrics of ocean acidification are occurring below the sea surface. And this is due to carbonate system nonlinearities. And across broad ocean regions, the subsurface PCO2 changes driven by anthropogenic OA exceed the atmospheric CO2 forcing itself. So those are kind of the primary takeaways that I want to leave you with. And now I want to get into a few of the reasons why we might care about this. I'm sure there are plenty more, but I'll highlight four reasons that we've kind of focused on. So one implication of these subsurface changes uh, is that there can be an increasing volume of water with multiple environmental stressors um, that could cause habitat compression. So this figure on the top is showing the thickness of waters that are simultaneously low in oxygen and high in PCO2. So we define high in PCO2 as hypercapnic or something with a PCO2, in this case, FCO2 over a thousand microatmospheres. And this generally matters because organisms 
that need to breathe. Like for example, fish who expel CO2 from their gills might have a harder time doing so in waters that have a high background PCO2 value. Um, the bottom panel is, and as you can see, there's <clears throat> extensive overlap in the hypoxia and hypercapnia domains in the North Pacific, um, the Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, and also off the West Coast of Africa. And then the um, bottom panel is showing uh, the transect through the Pacific. So the background is the FCO2 values themselves. And then the lines are differentiating different um, chemical thresholds. So we have the aragonite saturation state in the pre-industrial versus the year 2002. And then the FCO2, the hypercapnia horizon presently, or sorry, in the year 2002 versus pre-industrial. And then the 2002 hypoxia horizon. And so these are the distributions associated with the glowed up data set we have, which is referenced the year 2002. So it kind of makes, makes me wonder, you know, what's happened since then? It's been over 20 years and then what's projected. And so I think this is a topic that deserves more attention. Um, relatedly, with the largest anthropogenic carbon driven changes in some OA metrics occurring at depth, we may need to reconsider the hypothesis that organisms in upwelling regions may be more tolerant to OA due to natural carbon chemistry variability this is because the modern subsurface carbonate chemistry changes um, appear to be even larger than the surface changes. And so they're not reflective of pre-industrial conditions at all. Uh, in terms of carbon storage efficiency, this is the one that keeps me up at night. Um, surface ocean CO2 values have largely trapped atmospheric values over time, causing a slow change in the air sea disequilibrium. <clears throat> but Subsurface waters that exhibit these large uh, PCO2 changes, when they reemerge at the surface, the delta PCO2 value is going to be extremely high, which means that CO2 evasion will likely be very high. And this could actually impact carbon storage efficiency in areas where waters that are ventilating but don't usually fully equilibrate with the atmosphere before they subduct. In those areas, they might lose more carbon than they would otherwise. So I think that's a question that I would like to know more about. <laughs> And then finally, um, this has implications for marine carbon dioxide removal or MCDR impacts. So due to the greater sensitivity of subsurface waters to anthropogenic carbon addition, there may be important implications for MCDR approaches that increase biological fluxes of carbon to the ocean interior. <clears throat> On the flip side, some OA metrics are more sensitive to alkalinity addition at depth. So, this lower panel, the upper panel, something you've seen already, is the changes in CO2 due to anthropogenic carbon to the year 2002. And the lower panel, it's the PCO2 changes associated with DIC and TA additions that mimic calcium carbonate dissolution. And so you see larger reduction in PCO2 at depth, higher sensitivity there. And some of the most abundant minerals considered for use in alkalinity, ocean alkalinity enhancement do not fully dissolve in modern ocean um, at the surface. Um, but they could dissolve deeper in the water column, resulting in the mitigation of interior ocean acidification and possibly the mitigation of future ocean-based CO2 emissions when these waters reemerge at the surface. So that's just some fodder for the discussion. And um, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to any questions later on. Thanks. Great, thank you, Andrea. I appreciate your presentation. Um, just as a reminder for our audience, if you have questions for any of our presenters, throw them in the, the Q&A and we'll address them at the end. Um, now I'll bring us to our last speaker, who's Dr. Uh, D. Chi. Um, Dr. Chi could not join us live today, but has pre-recorded a presentation that we'll play for you. Um, we're having some technical difficulties, so please bear with us, um, but we'll we'll get it uh, up and running the best we can. Um, Dr. Chi is a professor at the Polar and Marine Research Institute at Jaimei University. He has been selected in the National Youth Talent Support Program of China since 2022. He obtained his PhD from Jaimen University and has extensively contributed to research on ocean carbon cycle, ocean acidification, marine biogeochemistry, um, particularly in polar regions, and their interplay with global climate change. Um, so with that, I think we can pull up Dr. Chi's video. Thanks. 
Thank you for the invitation and the introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chidi from the Poro Marine Research Institute in Jime University. As you can see it in the gift picture, the Arctic Ocean is experiencing Germanic CS retreat due to climate change. As a consequence, it triggering significant biogeochemical response and we focus on the carbonate cycle. In this talk, I would like to walk you through our latest work on climate change, dry CO2 uptake and acidification in the Arctic Ocean from 1994 to 2020. A very brief background for our study is that our Earth has seen large increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration and temperature. The emission of anthropogenic CO2 induced global warming and climate change. The ocean covers 70% of the Earth's surface area and takes up 26% of the atmospheric CO2, in which way we often refer to as ocean carbon sink. Among the oceans, polo and subpolo regions are the most important ones because they contribute to more than 40% CO2 sink due to primary to the low temperature. As a consequence of the ocean carbon sink. The ocean is now suffering unprecedented ocean acidification. Traditionally, we use pH and aragonized saturation state omega to describe ocean acidification. As we can see in the left figure, the decrease in pH at present and in the future has already exceeded the normal valuations during the past eight eight hundred thousand years. The red figure tells that the high latitude polar, polar, polar ocean has seen the most serve ocean acidification in regards of omega. However, observation is very sparse in the Arctic Ocean and therefore uh, need more attention. In this context, we have actually spent a lot of efforts to investigate things going on in the Arctic Ocean. We have illustrated that the Western Arctic Ocean is an important component of carbon sink. In the basin area, CO2 uptake which are to 70 million tons since 2010, which is 50% more than in the 2000. 2000. However, this aims are to reduce LC PLC gradients since 2008, which means that CO2 uptake capacity is reduced. On the contrary, CO2 uptake capacity in the shell area is increasing because biological removal of CO2 induces an increased delta P CO2 over time. Taken together, the Arctic Ocean comes for more than 30% of total global ocean carbon sink, but will decrease in future. A serious problem of such CO2 uptake is that it will cause ocean acidification. We have found that in the basin area, acidified surface waters increase by 1.5 percent per year, which is four times faster than observed in the Pacific and the Atlantic. As we can see in the middle figure, the acid acidified waters look like a tu blue tombs are from the Pacific winter water layer, which is the oldest waters and accumulate with large amount of CO2. In the Chukchi Sea, the biological Removal of surface CO2 will respirate in the subsurface layers. The total water chromes significant acidification was also observed. pH and omega declined from 2002 to 2019, uh, about two to three times greater than atmosphere CO2 project. The the enhanced acidification in the Chukchi Sea is mainly driven by enhanced dissolved inorganic carbon owing to atmosphere CO2 uptake 
and the biological activity. And we conclude that the Arctic Air Ocean is experiencing the most served OA than any other open ocean. Then an important scientific question is rise. Why the Arctic o o Ocean Acidification fasted? Most studies were focusing on the subsurface instead of surface, which has direct contact, contact with, with the atmosphere. To answer this, we have to be aware that the climate change is taking place in the Arctic. An amplified Arctic warming happens at four times faster than global mean level, and this leads to a sharp decline in the sea ice estate. With, with minus 15% per, per decade. We hypothesis that the climate change driving sea ice retreat uh, is best to induce OA. Here we map the, the special temporal distribution of surface pH and omega. Basically, we divided the Arctic Ocean into five regions regions, including shelf, southern Canada Basin, northwest Canada Basin, northeast Canada Basin, and the ice cover region. It is clear that low pH and omega area are expanding from 1994 to 2020. To describe the decadal variation, we first developed a series of big data processing methods. We integrate 47 crews cruises from international database and gradient data with a specific resolution. A quality control and cross crossover adjustment were then applied on the data synthesis. Before getting the final evolution of decadal trends, we also run the sensitivity test. This is an analyzation, uncertainty assessment to test the repair representative of our data and uh, robust of the chain. All these tests show good interconsistency. Therefore, we, we, got, get, we got the decadal chain rates for pH and omega. Overall, the acidification rate is three to four times higher than elsewhere in the global open ocean. This Observation rates in the Western Arctic Basin are also much faster than those projected by both regional and global model, models. We found that o OA in the basin area is the strongest and it is weak in the ice cover region. This implies that OA must have some connection, connection with sea ice. So we try to put all these variations into one plot and figure out their relationship. The red cycles in the upper panel is the sea ice extent, which shows quickly dropped from 1994 to 2020, but this trend is weakened afterwards. The middle panel and the bottom panel shows the OA matrix and reveal factors. Overall, a very good agreement can be found between sea ice extent and these parameters as sea ice extent reduce pH and omega decrease. To gain a better understanding of these relationships, we adopt a days since ice retreat concept. This concept describes the time since when sea ice concentration falls below 50 percent with leaves, we are able to know for each data point, particularly those in the seasonal ice cover zone, the timing of the measure, measurement relative to the sea ice information and melt. Therefore, we can separate the summer period into ice cover, ice melt, and ice free status. The most rapid, the most rapid OA developers during ice ice melt period and is also going also pro, progressing with time period. Lowest pH was observed during the latest 
11 to 2020 period. All of these agree with our time state simulation. So we conclude that a combustion of sea ice melt dilution um, all leads to a surface PCO2 increase and uh, enhance OA. I would like to take this slide to further explain how how this happens. The Arctic cold water behind Benesis, the sea ice actually has a large deficit in pH in DIC with respect to atmosphere equilibrium. Therefore, once sea ice retreats, it's like it is like a dot is open for CO2 to exchange. This progress can be fa fairly quick because the gradient is large and the surface mislayout is shallow due to satisfaction. More sophisticatedly, we, we set a four-state evolution of CO2 update and OA. The first state is that dilution induce low PCO2 and with different different response in pH and omega, high pH but lower omega. The second state happens as a gas exchange compensates the dilution induced CO2 loss. And the third state is that system turns to approach the LC CO2 equilibrium. And the final step is that the sea surface CO2 follows the increase in the atmospheric CO2 and enhance OA. During this process, Omega has seen the large, largest drop because dilution has reduced it from the beginning. We call these four steps as ice melt driven enhanced anthropogenic CO2 acidification. And we presume that this mechanism will take place and continue for the next few decades until totally ice free in the summer Arctic. With the use of such mechanism, we can now explain why OA in the Arctic Ocean is the most served land alus. And uh, at last, I would like to elaborate a bit on the influence of our work on the global communities. The Chinese research vessel Xiaolong for the surveys in the polar ocean has been showed for the first time on our cover page published on the Nature Climate Change in 2017. And our work has been slated as a as recent national advanced scientific scientific achievement to attempt the opening days of Chinese embassy in the United States in 2019, which raised the importance of international cooperation on carbon emission reductions to address climate change. A total of 30 programs were chosen, and we are the only one from the Polo study field. As a conclusion, we have constructed the decadal scale Arctic CO2 data synthesis and uh, our re results reveal the decadal variation in Arctic CO2 sink and the ocean acidification. And we also explained the climate change driving Arctic rapid ocean acidification and the carbon cycle. All right, I would like to stop here and take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you for um, playing that video. It was great. I'm glad it worked out. And we can move now into our question and answer session. We have about 10 or 15 minutes for uh, questions and discussion. So if anyone in the audience um, has questions, please type them into the, the Q&A box and we'll bring them up. And um, if our presenters could uh, show their faces again, turn on your cameras um, so we can have a uh, discussion. Our first- We have one question. Yes, yeah. So our first question has rolled in and it is, um, in addition to C13, is there another way to identify the anthropogenic influence um, on DIC measurements? And maybe Weijian, you could get us started with that. 
Well, thank you for the question. Actually, uh, the global ocean community, you know, consistent measure DIC over the last 40 years and uh, then through um, extended multiple linear regression method and, and other method to look at the anthropogenic carbon signal in the inventory. Although that inventory is small, but the DIC measurement has been very precise. So they were able to demonstrate that, see the DIC increase. So this carbon sorting is a, a newer method, although there are some carbon sorting measures in the past because of a lower spatial resolution and temporal resolution. So that advantage of being more sensitive measure as for anthropogenic here to has not been achieved because of that. And that's because a traditional method takes a lot of time. So a new method actually can analyze like in this recent A16 North Cruise, we analyzed 3000 carbon sorting sample at the sea. That was unprecedented in the past the people bring like 500 bottle back home and take two years maybe you know to get it analyzed at the uh, uh, Hui's um, uh, lab now actually with a long line before it was a, a poor quiz lab but we actually measured that at sea and with a very high resolution and as you see what I presented for the uh, ECOA data uh, so we are hoping to use that to see more clearly anthropogenic CO2 induce the uh, change. At least it's independent. So with both carbon sorting and DIC, we can be more confident to measure anthropogenic CO2 accumulation, which actually one of my students machine really did with the DIC in the East Coast. And we hope next uh, step is use a carbon sorting add another uh, constraint and uh, possibly more uh, sensitive constraint. So, yeah. So it's it's not as a, the only definitely yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian. Um, Dick, I see you have your hand raised. Do you have a question for the panelists? Yeah, this is uh, directed at Andrea, but anyone can chime in as well. <clears throat> Very interesting talk, Andrea. I really appreciate your contribution. And the question I have is uh, how these sun subsurface nonlinearities, how may they affect the either the uh, production and calcification of calcium carbonate mineral phases in the water column or the dissolution? Do you, would you see an enhancement of the of the changes in in those particular phase resulting from these nonlinear changes in the water column. Thanks, Dick. Um, for the saturation state findings, um, we essentially found that there was like a reduction in the anthropogenic carbon impact, so a slight mitigation of changes throughout the water column, um, but they were quite small. So I think if anything, it's sort of um, slowing down what we would otherwise expect to be happening. I mean, it's doing what we expect based on carbonate chemistry, but it's essentially a mitigating effect in, in terms of the nonlinearities for that. But it is quite small based on the 2002 analysis. Do you, do you have any feeling about the calcification processes? I guess I would just say... I don't think our results and add too much to that body of literature on reductions in saturation state. I feel like it is a surface intensified process in that case. Um, so I think that there's not a, a whole lot of nuance for that particular OA metric based on this work. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. Um, I have a question for Helen. Um, just thinking about biological OA thresholds. Do you know of any, you talked a lot about pteropods and, and their thresholds. Do you know of any other organisms that have thresholds identified as almost kind of as clearly as that? And what are your thoughts on developing like a general biological boundary if there are differences between organisms? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a really difficult one. I mean, what organisms do you kind of start with? There's certainly been a lot of work done on oysters, uh, particularly on the West Coast US. There's been some uh, metrics devised there to look at oyster larval production uh, associated with aragonite saturation states. Um, and certainly for populations in that locality, it, they seem to hold. Um, we've done a bit of meta-analysis um, again on oysters um, that suggests that there's some other uh, factors that might be influenced, but we're still kind of at early days in exploring that. Um, phytoplankton, for instance, we know that pick to pock ratios are associated with different carbonate parameters. Um, there's quite a clear relationship with pH, um, so a declining um, inorganic carbon to organic organic carbon content in in E. Hux, uh, e. Huxley, Malian e. Huxley, which is a coccolithophore species of phytoplankton. So again, as a kind of species indicator for that sort of um, organism, that's quite a useful one to, and it's also quite a useful proxy because we can actually measure some of those parameters from satellites now as well. So that's uh, potentially an avenue that we can explore as well. And then there's, yeah, there's other work, uh, Nina Bedasek and, other, and others have worked also looking at thresholds um, for echinoderms. Um, and I know Sam DuPont and others have, have kind of thought about whether particularly early life stages, again, are, are, are particularly vulnerable to pH levels. Um, and there's been some evidence to suggest that um, early life stages of some of the crab species as well um, have associated thresholds. So we're kind of starting to build a evidence base, I guess, if you like, of, of threshold levels associated either with pH, CO2 or, or aragonite saturation state. Um, I think it's still relatively early days on knowing whether we can apply those at a global scale. We know from the literature and from experiments and also just from, from observations in the field that the natural conditions and the pre-exposure conditions can determine how a population responds and it can respond quite differently even in the same species depending on whether you're in a in a sort of polar environment or whether you're in a temperate environment and so it that makes things a bit complicated in that respect um but i do think we need to remember that a chemical threshold is is just one aspect of this problem and that actually for many of the responses that we're thinking about when it comes to society and societal impacts is that we're, it's the biological thresholds that are going to be important but it's it's a difficult one to to give that single value to um so yeah i think there's got to be a balance between finding something that's a useful indicator that we can we can put forward to people to say this is this is where we need policymakers to be saying well enough is enough no more co2 emissions because this is causing things to become unsafe or, or whatever you want how how you want to word it um versus the kind of scientific um knowledge and, and uncertainties and reducing uncertainties in in being able to actually put values on different species um so yeah okay, yeah thank you and we, we have a um a similar question that came in or kind of along the same line um of what are are there any obstacles like instead of assessing um, boundaries as saturation states if are can you assess as a ph boundary for organisms um, and how does that relate back to like the monitoring aspect because we can measure ph directly and have to calculate saturation state is that any is that possible is it useful um, when thinking about uh, boundaries yeah, absolutely. I, I think we need to explore these a little bit more. Um, aragonite saturation state's been the one that's kind of been picked up on primarily because of this the, the direct link to dissolution. And it's a, quite an obvious um, issue, especially, I mean, it was really interesting to hear about the deep sea, the Andrea, Andrea's work, and it's quite concerning when we think about these uh, maybe deep sea organisms or deep sea corals and things like that. But yeah, I think um, I think we need to explore some of the other parameters. Certainly, pH um, pH is a tricky one because of its temperature dependence. So, uh, explaining to non scientists why you get higher pH levels in the Arctic versus lower pH levels 
in the tropics and how if you warm the climate you're going to get changes in, in those in different respects so it gets a little bit complicated as an indicator in that sense um so fine kind of explaining to the non-scientific audience um and we also have to remember that ph is a logarithmic scale so kind of saying i don't know like an 80 percent change or what it wouldn't it would you'd have to kind of think about how best you could define that boundary um again in terms of hydro probably in terms of hydrogen ions rather than ph per se um but yeah i think uh these i think th these aspects needs to be explored and, and whether it's actually the answers may be combining a couple of those issues or having a value in co2 terms that actually allows you to um be relative to to a ph or aragonite saturation state that's considered safe or safe or not um is maybe the way to go because co2 like i said in the presentation is maybe a bit more of an understandable parameter to to the wider audience um but yeah, things to explore and, and it'd be great to have community discussion on that kind of thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Helen. Um, not seeing any other questions roll in. We uh, have, Dick, did you? The, no, we have, have Jean, uh, Jean Newton, rising hand. Okay. Hello. Jen, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, I, I'd turn on my video if I could, uh, but <laughs> um, I'm in a place where the internet just shut down up in Friday Harbor Labs. And so I'm doing the best I can from a cell phone, but I really um, appreciated all the talks so much. Um, but I have to say that with, as particularly the last three um, authors, it just, you you all gave me some news that's that's very depressing um but it's it's an understanding where as a biological oceanographer you deepened my understanding of the current state of ocean acidification the uh you know the regionalization of the planetary boundaries helen the the importance of the subsurface andrea and then the the compounding of the sea ice with the oa um gee i um I really learned a lot and I, I just want to reach out and, and implore that um, it, it's so important that these messages get shared beyond the scientific community, as you all know. And I want to encourage you to, you know, take grab hold of our um, OA Research for Sustainability Decadal Program, where we have outcomes that are trying to communicate the science for action, where we have outcomes that are trying to um, educate more the, the public, um, ocean literacy, and where we have an outcome on, on linking with policy. And, and whether you can or can't participate in a working group, think about how you would bulletize your, your main messages and, and, and get those out so that um, we don't wait for publications and people to read them and, and then the the amount that it takes to distill down those 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 messages. So be in touch with the um ORS um group. We um there's our website and thank you Kalina for for putting that right to me. <laughs> My email is easy to find. I am so impressed with the research and I think it's just so important. So I just put that out there as a as a personal plea. So thank you so much for um and if anybody wants to comment, great, but I just really wanted to make that comment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate you being here. Um, I think we're getting yeah. close to our time. So I, I, I'll mm -hmm. give it to Dick to um, give your final question Richard. or comment. Yeah. Sorry, Shaima. We have Richard rising hand. Yeah, go, go ahead. This question is for Wei Jun Kai. I just wanted to know is is it feasible with the data that you're obtaining for Del C thirteen uh, to get a independent estimate of the total amount of anthropogenic CO two from those measurements that can be used in the kind of analyses we've seen being conducted by Andrea and others? 
Uh, good question. I, I have to think about that, how exactly to use that. Uh, from first principle, yes, uh, we will be able to do that. It, it add another particularly powerful with carbon-13 is it uh, allow us to identify the source of the CO2, uh, whether it comes from organic carbon or from atmosphere, whether it's anthropogenic or you know natural. So I, I think, yes, uh, I right now in coastal ocean, it just uh, have additional complication is uh, uh, water coming out from the river and from marsh, uh, tidal marsh, etc. So I needed to really dive into this. And uh, yeah, I hope next time we meet, I will be able to uh, get really get in, yeah, bring a good news how we address that. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to thank all the speakers today and for Liza for organizing this this wonderful session. Uh, one of the things that comes out of this session is that we have a lot of work to do, as Jan has pointed out, to communicate what we are learning. What we are learning is very important, and we need to make sure that this communicated to the public and to our policymakers, because everything that you're doing has enormous impacts on our ecosystems and coastal waters. So I encourage everybody to share their information and share it with uh, the communication groups within ORS and so that we can get that information out as much as we possibly can. Thank you very much for this session. Thank you, Dick. Um, and with that, I think I'll hand it back over to Shaima to close us out. Mm -hmm. We would like to thank you, to thank the organizers, the moderators and the speakers for the great session. And we thank you, the audience for joining us for OWA Week 2023. Please don't forget to consult the website and to register to any other sessions that may interest you. If you would like to stay up to date with GOA ON community, consider signing up as GOA ON member at www.goaon.org backslash member. To discover more about ocean acidification research for sustainability, please scan this, Q, this QR code. Thank you all and see you next time. Goodbye.